The drum is the voice of the of our ancient past. It's from the earth. It's what's below us. It's our foundation. And then the ayakashkis, the rattles, represented the, you know, the different kingdoms. They were divided into four kingdoms. You know, the the plants, trees, animals, and the insects. And so rattles represent that. And then the flutes represent the upper world. And then so now you have this trilogy the flute, drum, and rattle, and, you know, all, you know, representing different parts of our world. And so when you do play them, you know, you are the voice of creation. 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 Peace, everyone. Welcome to Masters of Ceremony. This is your host, Andrew Ascari Poor, also known as Fifth God. Today's episode was easily one of the most important and rewarding conversations I've had on this platform yet, and that is because I got to speak to somebody I deeply admire and respect, and that man is Guillermo Martinez. Guillermo is a musician, master craftsman, and wisdom keeper of indigenous instruments who currently resides in Southern California. He is the owner of Quetzalcoatl Music, an instrument shop and educational resource dedicated to the distribution and preservation of sacred instruments and their history. Along with being a master craftsman of native flutes, drums, rattles, and other instruments, Guillermo is also a gifted performer and one-third of the incredibly talented musical trio Bamboo Cedar Oak. I first came across Guillermo's work when I first began building ceremonial drums and was seeking some counsel and advice and education through an online medium of how to properly care for these instruments, how to learn about their historical background outside of what my teachers have taught me. And to come across Guillermo's work was such a blessing, such a breath of fresh air, because here is an elder and someone who the community truly considers a master of their craft, willing to share all of their resources, all of their education, all of their blessings of their lineage to everyone else in a public forum. So Guillermo's work really touched me in a beautiful way. I knew I wanted to have him on the podcast, and we ended up discussing some really beautiful and important things. In this episode, we discuss how Guillermo experienced an ancestral reawakening as a young man through traditional Aztec dancing. We spoke about the early days of how he began to learn and play these sacred instruments and how his love of ceremony developed and also the meeting of his late mentor, Javier Kias. We discussed the confidence and blessings one receives by building these instruments themselves. And we went on to speak about how learning from various cultures other than your own is so deeply important, how nature and spirit respond to the magic of music, playing music from the heart rather than the mind, responsible and respectful use of plant medicines, the importance of lineage and mentorship, and the personal journey of fatherhood that he went through, and advice for all aspiring parents who wish to raise children during these very difficult and confusing times we're living in. So as I said, this podcast was such a blessing for me. I hope you all receive some value from it. And if you do, please leave a review, a rating, a comment, a share with a friend, and all of this is deeply appreciated. Let's get right into it. Guillermo, thank you so much for joining Masters of Ceremony and for coming onto this platform to speak with me. Yeah, you're welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. It's, uh, you know, just with these times right now, with um, what's going on in politics and the world and, you know, just trying to keep it together here and keep calm and, you know, be of service to people. Yes. Yes. I think collectively we're feeling the necessity for, for unity more than ever. And, uh, uh, I'm feeling that it is very timely to be interviewing you on today's show because I truly believe that some of the practices that you have engaged in for the majority of your life, can help bring harmony and unity within our communities, uh, specifically through the practices of these sacred instruments. 
And that is one of the overarching topics I'd like to discuss today is your work and your path towards becoming a master instrument maker in your tradition. Mm. And I, I really would just like to begin with learning more about your upbringing, your earliest memories in a sense, and the way that you navigated finding yourself towards embracing your indigenous traditions as a young man. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, I've talked about this before, but it's always nice to, to go back and reflect on this. Um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley here in California in Southern California. And, um, my parents were immigrated from Mexico. Now, this was a long time ago. This has probably been in the late fifties, maybe early six, very early sixties. And, um, so I grew up like most, most kids that growing up in Mexico or those that are of immigrant families in that, you know, you you grow up believing that, you know, you're Catholic, um, Spanish is your language, uh, mariachis and Norteñas and that kind of music is, is the music of your people, the voice of your people. And, um, so I grew up thinking that for a very long time and never felt right about going to church. Never, um, you know, there were just so many things that just didn't feel right to me. Mm. And, um, and then it was my, actually my, my youngest sister that, um, well, she probably would have been 10 or, or something like that, or even nine. She was young and, uh, she asked me for a ride to take her to practice. And I go, what kind of practice, to dance practice, she said. And I said, what kind of dance practice do you do? And she said, Aztec dancing. And um, I was quite surprised to hear that. I was like, wow, okay, that's so that's a thing. And uh, I had just gotten back from the beach. And so I said, well, you know, if you need a ride, I'll, I'll give you a ride. And it was in downtown LA, at like at a community park. And, um, like, you know, like a, a basketball court, you know, a community center. And, uh, so, uh, I went just to get it out of the car to just, uh, cause you know, she's little and I didn't, um, pardon me here. Okay. I think it's ended, but anyway, so I get out of the car cause I'm just going to drop off my little sister here in downtown LA, you know, 30 minutes from our house. And uh, so I get out, and as soon as I walk into the stadium, they just hit the the wetwits or the big drums and the conch. They're blowing the conch because they, um, ensayos or dance, you know, with your practices that you do, or you run them almost like a ceremony. You know, you start with the conch and the drums, and you do the offerings. They burn copal, they burn copal the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, so that really kind of floored me right then and there. It kind of woke me up. Uh, there was no denying that I could not, you know, I had to stay there and I stayed there that day in practice and kept going back after that, you know, it was very consistent and for many years, and, you know, even to this day. But I think it was the conch shells and the drums. It's like it, it opened up my, my heart and my crown chakra all at the same time. And like um, ancestral memories or like an ancestral calling, just saying you have to do this. And so that's, that's my earliest memory. And I was pretty young then, a teenager. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there the mystery started to unfold, you know, about who I am and, and so forth, you know, um, the, the veils of lies and deceit start to unfold. You know, you start to realize that, you know, Spanish is not your language, your first language that you, the people of Mexico have indigenous languages. You know, you have 
I mean, there's like, I think there's 56 or more. Wow. Major languages and about the same number of major tribes, you know, like the Yaquis and Otomis and Mazatecos and, and, and Mayans and, you know, just on and on and on. And each, each of these groups has their language, their customs, their instrumentation, and the way they pray, you know, and prayers can be pretty much summed up very easily, you know, that it's, it's spoken, it's sang, it's done with movement or dance, it's done through theater, it's done through, through, the, through the instruments, through the music. Um, it seemed like every part of life was a prayer. You know, you were constantly, it was a cycle of, of observing nature, the natural world, and the ceremonies re revolved around that. And the different seasons, it's just like an ongoing, you know, uh, thing that was part of your everyday life. Mm. Beautiful. It, uh, it truly sounds like you had a moment of, of awakening, getting to witness and par participate in those ancient dances. And um, just to reminisce on, you know, I'm, I'm very young, maybe half your age. And I remember the first real ceremonial experience I had, it felt like a return to home. I felt like my heart had been opened up in a way that was not previously opened up. And um, that has led me down a journey of speaking with you today. So I would like to uh, see how this transition of just merely experiencing ceremony led to a decision of yours to want to learn how to build these sacred instruments, to learn how to further your connection with these practices. Yeah. Yeah, I would just want to reiterate that, yeah, it is kind of like, it did feel like coming home. And I remember my first sweat lodge was with the uh, California Indians, um, Ohlone. And this gentleman has since passed away, but I remember coming out of the, the, the sweat lodge and, or the Nipi, and um, just, he said, look above you, you know, taking your breath, like, feel like it's your first breath. Feel like you're looking at the world for the first time. You know, you just come out and we did our prayers and now you're here, part of this world. And it really did feel so special mm. and so sacred. And those kind of things just are life changing. Yes. But getting back to the instrumentation. Um, so, yes, I started dancing. I started... Um, um, doing ceremonies with wherever I could find them. It's like, almost like I was looking for ceremonies, almost like on a, on every, instead of going out and partying on the weekends, I was looking for ceremonies to go to. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You know, cause it, there is, there is a community and once you're part of it, you know, they, they do invite you. And they, of course. Oh, there's a sweat lodge over here. Or there's a talking feather here. Or there's this or that, or, or we got a, you know, or as a dancer, we have presentations to do here or there. And um, so, um, but you always need instruments, you know, and there was nobody really making them. And, you know, I just remember the, the group that I was with, he had like a, like sacks of instruments, like turtle shells or ayotlins and rattles and this and that and the other, teponaslis. And, um, but really badly taken care of, <laughs> just like mm. all thrown together in a bag. And it's because, you know, he was, the person was hustling, you know, it was like going from one event to another, you know, maybe on a weekend we go do three, three or four presentations, you know, and you're, you're driving all over, Southern California to do these and instruments were not, were just thrown together. But anyway, so they need to be repaired. They needed, I would look at them and then, you know, try, you know, making them myself. And, and then I found my teacher, you know, 
and that was Javier Quija Shayok, which had recently passed away uh, about a month and a half now. Yes. But, uh, you know, I was living near the Rose Bowl swap meet, and I was living in, in uh, Highland Park or South Pasadena, South Pasadena area. And I decided to take some of my instruments because I acquired quite a few that I'd been building. And um, decided just to set up a, a stall. <laughs> hmm. I don't know where I got this idea, but. Yeah. So I set up all my things. You have to get there super early in the morning, like four in the morning, get in, get in queue and you get your place. You, you, you know, you pull up into your place with your car and then you set up your stuff. And, and uh, I, at that time was, you know, doing ceremony pretty much daily. So I, I like Copal, I do my offerings and smudge my, myself and my space and all my things. And out waiting to come in was Javier and he smells the Copal and he, and so the Copal brought him to me. He was like, who is burning Copal? And mm. he had to find out. So he found me and he looked at my, uh, amateur attempts at instrument making and you know he said well he saw that I was you know um keen on it you know something I really wanted to do so he said yeah come to my studio and and he had beautiful instruments you know and his were all well taken care of he you know he told me about the important because you know if you make them you're going to take care of them and especially if they're you know, they're hard to acquire and, you know, and you're using them in a ceremonial way. So it's like something you, you know, you cherish and not just thrown together in a bag. Yeah. In a, you know, in a coffee, coffee bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyways, so that's how I met Javier at the Rose Bowl. Wow. You know, he, uh, he, you know, I stuck with him and, you know, would see him all the time. And we started, started playing music with him and, and that kind of led me to where I'm at today. Beautiful, beautiful. So meeting Javier Kias, your, your mentor, uh, may he rest in peace. Meeting him served as a catalyst for you not only to learn how to build these instruments, but to respect them, to maintain them, take care of them, and also provided you an opportunity to perform with this mentor, which it seems like performance has been at the root of your life just as much, if not more, than the creation of these instruments. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's important. You know, I know plenty of people who can just make instruments. I even know a couple of flute makers that make them, but don't know how to play or don't play at all. Wow. It just seems really odd that, but anyways, you know, um, I don't just, for me, it just seems like playing and making were one and the same. And, you know, the, the performances with Javier would be like what I think people would now call a sound bath. Oh, so wow. this, whole idea of sound baths and, you know, <laughs> sound healing. Yeah. We were doing that so long ago. Mm. And even before us, there were other groups like that, like uh, Tribu and um, couples, solo, solo artists out of Mexico that would use um, these ancient instruments. And a lot of times they were using authentic ones, instruments that are thousands of years old. Wow. Because, you know, you can acquire them there in Mexico and even acquire them here. And I have a few in my collection. And um, so, you know, we were doing that a long time ago. Yeah. Mm. So I would love to hear from you, Guillermo, how working with these instruments, actually building them for yourself and not only performing, but also just using these sacred items as uh, tools for meditation and for self-healing and for healing of others. 
what were some key things that unfolded within your life as you began to truly commit to learning from these instruments? Because although I'm not even remotely closely uh, as experienced as you are in these things, I see that these instruments almost have a, a spirit of their own. They have a, their own volition. They want to be played. They want to be used in, in good ways. And I'm curious to see what type of transformations were occurring within you as you deepened your practice with playing and building these instruments. Well, at the very beginning, you know, um, you know, the flute was, was a struggle at first, you know, the, um, when I first met Javier, I, I was, I was really shy. And one of the elders in the, in our dance group, you know, this gentleman probably is gone by now. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I was in my twenties and at that time he was in his sixties. So <laughs> you're over a hundred by now. Yeah. But, uh, he worked in, he worked in the, in cinema in film. And so he wouldn't be around too often, but he would show up when he was in town, when he wasn't working on a, on a film shoot somewhere. And, um, he always seemed really elegant and, you know, like very, very like well-traveled. And he asked me if I was, um, if I had a girlfriend, I go, Oh no, I can't, I can't talk to girls. And, um, I was way too shy. He goes, well, you should get this, you know, there's tell, told me the story of the native American flute and how it was used for courting, how the young man was able to overcome his shyness and, and capture the heart of beautiful women with a, a beautiful woman with this instrument. And that's what I asked. The first thing I asked Javier for was one of those. And he was quite taken like, well, that's okay. That's really simple. Hmm. And, uh, so he made me one out of bamboo, you know, it didn't take very long. And, and, uh, he, and he also gave me a double flute at that time, a clay one that I still have. And, um, I think the very first instrument he gave me. And, um, but I remember that, um, uh, I couldn't play it and I struggled and struggled. And finally I just set it aside. And we walked by it, you know, for a couple of weeks. And then finally I picked it up again after being totally frustrated. And, and I was able to get something out of it. Mm. And um, so I stuck with it. And that's, and I think that's what uh, I think a lot of people that are starting is that, you know, don't give up. Don't, don't let, you know, frustration or the obstacles that you have, you know, get in your way, you know, keep at it. And that's good for a lot of things in life. You know, like we, we come into obstacles in our life and sometimes we, we don't want to go through them. We, we want to go around them. And, uh, but I stayed with it and, um, I kept at it, you know, and in making them, you know, my, my skill as playing as a player develop and I'm also, also listening to people, listening to better players and, you know, um, being inspired and you just grow. I just grew as a, as a, as a player, as a, as an instrument maker, it all kind of went hand in hand. Mm. So for me now it's really simple and I'm no longer shy. And I feel I'm a, I'm a good teacher. I, I can intuit people and, you know, and, and, you know, if I'm working with someone one-on-one, -on -one, I can help them, you know, get through it. Um, and not get as frustrated as I was when I first, because imagine if I, if I never went back to it, mm -hmm. if I just gave up then you know, my life now would not be what I, what I'm experiencing now. Yes. Mm. I resonate with, with that story so much because I am someone who has suffered from shyness majority of my life, which I would say I have uh, recently broken out of 
in these recent years. And uh, the flute was also a catalyst for me in that sense, because I had always wanted to learn Native American flute. And I had went out of my way to get a, a big cedar F sharp, massive flute that was not a beginner flute for me in my hands. <laughs> and uh, I certainly went through a lot of frustration and putting it down. And I uh, still need to work with it in that way. And I'm feeling the confidence to work with it again. But what that experience led me to was when I put the flute down, I had an attraction to receiving a drum, a hand drum and uh, a circular frame drum. Mm -hmm. And I've always seen my elders use them in ceremony. I had become very connected with the heartbeat, with the memory that is embedded within that drum. And I had this very romantic idea that I would somehow just come across a drum one day in a store and it would call out to me and that would be my drum. And I went years <laughs> waiting in that sense. And it dawned on me actually last summer um, in about July during this COVID madness, how much I, my heart really was desiring a drum. And I had went for a walk in the forest myself. I had laid some tobacco down, some other offerings and just said a prayer to spirit for this drum to come into my life. And within two weeks, I just received the clearest of messages to build this drum myself. And uh, I had to laugh because all this time I was waiting for the drum to find me. And the message I received was that you need to build this with your own hands. Despite me being a, a person who is not necessarily good with my hands, or so I thought. So I went through the process of sourcing the materials and successfully building this 14 inch elk drum and did it in a prayerful way in a ceremonial way. Sure. And the confidence that I received Guillermo after completing this drum and seeing that it had dried correctly and that it, it that it looked aesthetically beautiful as well, which uh, is also important as you say, because that is a reflection of our state of mind when we were building that instrument to have that experience was life altering for me and my confidence and my confidence in singing, playing other instruments, uh, picking up the flute again. And I think the reason why I respect and gravitate towards your teaching so much is that you encourage others to customize their instruments, if not at least build them as well. And uh, I would love to hear some of the stories you maybe have seen uh, of people who have built their own drums or instruments and how it's affected their lives as well. Well, um, yeah, this is kind of a, uh, maybe we can just go back to like when I, how I first started teaching. Mm, please. Because, um, as I was living there in, in the South Pasadena area, and as you know, there's a very nice, very nice neighborhoods in that part of Southern California. It's very old. It's a lot. It's a it's an area where a lot of the the super wealthy um, industrialist or business people of Los Angeles lived, and they actually built a freeway so they can get to downtown LA. From, from where they lived, and that is the very first freeway. It's there in South Pasadena. And so, um, but anyways, so in this nice area, I would look around for, for yard sales. And I saw this these beautiful gourds, like gourd mask and some gourds. And I go and pull, pull over and I ask the person, uh, are those gourds for sale? And and she was quite, her name was Leigh Adams, and she's a good, great friend now. And she says, uh, what do you want with them? And I go, I want to make these instruments. And she described them to me. And and she's a teacher. And uh, she goes, so you can, can you teach what you're, what you're describing to me? And I go, yeah. And he goes, why don't you get some of your instruments and go here? 
And it was uh, Farron O'Connor Design Studios there in Pasadena. And it's a place where they would they were teaching, you know, like beadwork and, and glass making and jewelry classes. But um, they were kind of interested in like cultural things, you know, people. And so I showed up with instruments and I started teaching there very successfully. And um, this thing that you're mentioning about how you felt after creating something, you know, became very apparent to me then. And also um, later, a little bit later after that, I started teaching at the Waldorf School as a handwork teacher mm. and working with, with young kids from kindergarten up to, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade. And, and there were, you know, from a very young age, these kids are taught to make things and, and completing them. There has to be completion, you know, and the satisfaction that these, you see it in the children, you know, and also in the parents, you know, they're, they're pretty happy when they see these, these beautiful things that their children have made and spent a long time. You know, these things have to, you know, maybe take months yes. or, you know, maybe even a whole year. Like when we do, uh, I was teaching the kids how to make in the seventh grade, how to make a, a bird head flute, like in the, like in the original story of the Native American flute. And they would, you know, would spend, you know, six months on it to build. And, you know, the, a lot of these kids are, adults now, even parents, and they still contact me and are, show me gratitude for, you know, making them stick with it, you know, making them complete such a difficult project that these things are like treasures for them. And have since then been teaching, you know, um, in Japan and in Europe, in, in the UK, you know, flute making, drum making, rattle making. And my teacher was saying that, you know, people are hungry. People are hungry for, for, for truth, for a way to get to that original source, you know, that your original voice, the way, you know, all people used to pray with, with song and with, and with instruments. It's just some of us have forgotten. And, you know, in the Hopi prophecy, you know, we're, you know, we're, we as Native American people, we are the ones that are like, still remember how it is to do that. And that we have to remind our other brothers, our black brother, our black brothers, our, our yellow brothers, our white brothers, and that has to go with the teaching of the medicine wheel, the red, white, yellow, and black, you know, the, the directions and the colors and how they're all associated. And, you know, we're not, we're different, but we're also connected. And, and that's the one thing that I feel strongly in that I feel the work that I'm doing is helping people come back. We're all finding ourselves once again. We're all coming back to the center and finding that we are all unified and we just all have to get back to that same place. Hmm. Yes, brother. I, I feel like one of your reoccurring themes I see within your work is the encouragement of all people to become aware that these instruments, although the traditions may vary, these instruments are within all cultures. And you speak about the, the Holy Trinity of instruments in Native American cosmology, the, the drum, the rattle, and the flute. And from my experience of delving into your work, you are not someone who only knows about these Native traditional ways of these instruments, but you seem very familiar with the Japanese versions these Celtic versions, the African versions and variants of these different instruments. And that's not something I have always seen in instrument makers, specifically certain native instrument makers. Sometimes I have witnessed they may only know what is within their tradition. And 
I am curious to know what really propelled you to be willing and to be curious enough to learn from all of these different traditions on this planet. Yeah, I would say I was probably uh, a little uh, a little guilty of of that, and that just I only did Native American things. You know, my teacher was very like was very much like this, mm. and um, you know, he didn't like the the melding of like say ancient instruments with with modern instruments or in a modern context. He thought it was cool, but you know, it's like it's but it's not the way. And in my in my viewpoint, I felt like, you know, that it's okay to to come together. And I think it changed for me when I met an Englishman, uh, Nigel Shaw. He was uh, he was a world traveler. You know, he did he played at music festivals all over the world and did kind of ambient music, you know, and, um, he universe brought him to my door again. I was exhibiting at the, at the museum there in my neighborhood in the Southwest museum in Los Angeles. And, um, this guy pops up and he said, you know, I want one of those. Hmm. And because he had read, uh, in the, on the plane, an article about the, the Indian market that was there and he happened to be having a layover that day that he's supposed to be there. And so he took a, uh, a taxi from the airport, went to the museum and found me in search of a, a native American flute. And he said, as he was walking up to the museum, he heard me play. And so he came straight to me and he, he stayed as long as he could because he had to go back and make his flight, but he was there easily, you know, three, four hours. And, and we were uh, talking, you know, and, and I made other instruments for him after that. And then he invited me to come to England. And, uh, and I was a little, little sh nervous because, you know, like, like most kids from, uh, you know, Mexican kids that grew up in the barrios in Los Angeles or in the Valley, you know, we're not, we're not seeing, we don't feel like we're, like we're citizens of the world or like we're, you know, we have something to offer to the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, our self-esteem is, is so, um, so low. And a lot of that has to do with the colonization and how we're raised as children, you know, um, you know, that, that colonization really plays, weighs heavily on, on us you know, the descendants of that. And it was Javier that always was saying, you know, I remember telling me, you know, look at, look at our ancient cultures. They painted beautiful buildings. All the buildings were beautifully painted with murals and the instruments, the music, the clothing, you know, we have beautiful things. We were, we were smart culture. We were important culture, you know, relatively speaking to what was happening at, at that time in the world. You know, um, and, uh, you know, we have to get back to that. We have to let the world know, let them know that what we have to offer is important. You know, that are, but we have to reclaim it. We have to get back and start making it again. And not just rely on old pieces in museums, but, you know, rebuilding them, learn how to build them again. And so that's what we did. You know, we, we did that. And, you know, I'm happy to say that it's, it's thriving. And that, you know, that first trip to, to Europe, you know, the way I was received and, and every time after that and, and doors opening, you know, all throughout the world, you know, people wanting to, to know about, what I do and what we did here, you know, um, that it had value, that I had value. You know, the people of the ancient people of Mexico have value, that we had something beautiful to offer. And um, 
So um, that made me feel like I was a world citizen. Mm. That not only am I a descendant of of uh, ancient peoples of North America, but I started looking at it like I'm a citizen of the world. I'm a human being. And that goes all the way back to all Native, pre, you know, um, the way Native American people feel is that we're, we're human beings. Yes. We're the two legged on this world. We are, you know, responsible for this earth, taking care of it. And our relatives are the, the bird people, the winged people, the four leggeds the insects, the trees, the rocks, everything that we're all, we're all connected. We're all related. And when you really start to put that into practice and not separate yourself that, you know, I'm, you know, whatever tribe and our way is the way. And we're, you know, there's just so many ways to the same thing. That's what I'm realizing. Whether you're in a Buddhist temple in Japan, and they're praying with a taiko drum and so their instruments, you know, whether Shinto tradition or, or Buddhist, you know, we're all praying to the same thing. We're all trying to get to that same source. Mm. Wow. Yes, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I, I love that you took becoming or having this awareness of being a, a global citizen that that led you to forming the trio that you have released music under, which is bamboo, uh, cedar, oak. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And, uh, to forge this trine of very different cultures, but find a common ground and a unity amongst you three. Uh, it was beautiful me, for me to, to find that music because I have never seen a merging of cultures in that specific way. And I'm curious to hear, you just described a little bit about your relationship with your, your brother from England, but I'm curious to hear about the Japanese influence on not only your musical inspirations, but also in the development of your construction of these instruments? Yeah. Well, um, I would have to give credit to Nigel, who had the foresight to see that, you know, um, he was very much into the Native American flutes, about the beauty and the simplicity, even though he's he's British and, um, well, actually, he's, he's, I think he's Scottish, but, uh, Anyway, and then he met uh, a Japanese guy with this band called the Tenku Orchestra playing at Glastonbury. And he saw that they were playing Native American flute. It's because Carlos Nakai, prior to that, had, was in Japan and um, saw Hiroki's group, Hiroki Okano, the Tenku, you know, um, I think at that time it was called the Wind Traveling Band. And... Uh, he did a, a record with them, uh, Island of the Bow, which one of Carlos Nakai's early records. And, um, and I remember hearing it, you know, before I even knew. And, um, it was at, uh, it was up in Santa Cruz at a, at a pottery studio I had walked into and I, I heard this music and it was very, you know, um, ambient and I definitely could hear the Native American flute. And that's what, but the other instruments, I couldn't get, couldn't understand what they were. Mm. And I asked the, the potter, it was a woman that was throwing pots. And I go, you know, what are you listening to? And she told me, Carlos Nakai and uh, Island of the Bow. And then I found out it was like, a, you know, half Japanese, you know, Japanese guys with Carlos Nakai. And I thought, wow, this is really, this is really unusual. And I think, you know, Nakai was, we have to give credit to Nakai thinking, you know, the foresight to, to come together that way. And, um, 
But then here we are. I, I get a fly to England. We're going to go to Glastonbury. And here's, I meet Hiroki. And, um, and we're all the same age. We all have two, two children. You know, uh, our children are roughly the same age. There were just so many similarities. It's like, I just ran into some brothers. Mm, yeah. You know, and it was just so easy and so natural. We, you know, um, you know, thinking back on it, you know, we're, we're all raised very differently. You know, Nigel's raised completely different than I was. And so was Hiroki. But, you know, music is a language, you know, it's, or a form of prayer. And it doesn't really see color or where you come from in the world, just simply what it is. And so we just found that putting our voices together and we all have our different backgrounds and um, it just comes through in the music. I mean, we definitely have a sound. You know? Certainly. <laughs> and, uh, and one thing also that I, I realized in listening to our records is that you don't, you, you can't really, um, from one song to another, the changes are so different. Yes. You know, it's not, um, it's not like listening to a popular group now where you can know, you can kind of expect the sound to be kind of similar throughout the whole record. Yeah. You know, we're, I like that we're un unpredictable. Mm, me too. In which direction <laughs> the music's going to go. Mm. But, and the musicianship's really good. I, I got to give credit to those guys. You know, they're, they're great composers. You know, they have great feeling. And, um, you know, they're just impeccable musicians. And, you know, I'm just so lucky to, to play with them and to, we, that we found each other. And that the music we're, we've been creating for quite a few years now has, you know, helped a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, that's a perfect segue into one of the main questions I had for you. And that is when picking up one of these instruments, sometimes people, especially if they're beginning, they feel intimidated, especially if they don't understand sheet music or if they don't have a academic background in music. But something you and many, many elders teach is that simply playing from the heart, from, of course, getting the core foundational skill set built is important. But after that, simply playing from the heart is the best medicine for ourselves and others. What do you say regarding people who may feel intimidated that they don't understand sheet music, or they don't have that highly intellectual or academic mind to compose something on paper. What advice would you have for those people? Well, first of all, you have to get, um, you know, um, kind of set aside the, the notion that you need something in front of you to, to guide you in your playing. Mm. You know, like, uh, especially people who are trained musicians, you know, they, the concept of just, uh, improvising or playing from what's from within yourself is really foreign to them. Yeah. And kind of, kind of scary because, you know, their whole life in their musical career, they've been told what to play. And um, so I, th I think for a, a beginner who has no musical experience, it's much easier you know, build up your foundation, you know, learn how to get the right notes properly, build up the mechanics and, and just, yeah. And just close your eyes and, and play or, or put yourself in a natural surrounding and look out what's in front of you. I find children are, are quite inspiring. If you just kind of sat, you know, um, in a park, if you're able to watch, you may even say a guy throwing a frisbee to his dog and have his dog, you know, just watching that and just 
playing that feeling that you get or watching children on a swing or kids running around on bikes or just the stillness of a, of a stream going through some woods or through, or looking out at a meadow, you know, all these places and all these situations have feelings. And, um, I think from the very beginning of, of man's history, you know, we've felt the need to, to put like a film, a music score to our life. Mm. And so, you know, just gotta, um, I think when you're playing, playing properly, Native American or, you know, traditional instruments, your mind is not even present. If your mind is quiet, and your mind's not even there, then you know you're playing properly. Mm, yes. At least I feel. Because yeah. I know you in concert, there's some structures to our songs, but there's parts of in our songs that are where we improvise. And I I just get lost in those parts. You know, I don't I'm not thinking, nothing like that. It's just all feeling. It's really easy for me, really natural. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, I've seen firsthand, and I remember the first couple of times I witnessed it. It truly blew me away uh, when I would witness some of these medicine men and medicine women who I've done work with uh, use certain whistles or ocarinas or the different rattles and and drums and use them in a way in a natural setting in which nature is actively responding to the output of these, of these instruments. There's an yeah. actual correspondence. There's a reaction, uh, which is very clear. It's not, uh, it's not something fabricated or something that we are seeing as just our human mind creating. It's very apparent that the birds, the animals, the trees, the winds, the rains, the thunders are reacting to this pure expression that we are using these instruments with and mm -hmm. when i had first began to experience this this was another one of those heart piercing moments of seeing how rich this existence is seeing the magic of that we are not just perceiving nature but that we are nature and i think that's the power of of ceremony that i have experienced personally seeing this yeah. interaction and I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well, because you have obviously experienced that tenfold. Well, um, just hearing you talk and just making me think about uh, one afternoon after, I don't know, maybe a couple years of building instruments. Um, Javier just thought it was time for me to hear this. And, you know, he was talking about um, at the very beginning of the colonization, you know, the, the one order that was really intrigued by, you know, the, the spirituality or the, or the, you know, the religion that exists, you know, uh, in an area that they're occupying with the Jesuits. So the Jesuits went about interviewing all the different priests of, uh, of Tenochtitlan or Mexico City at the time, you know, because they're, you know, if you're going to colonize a a group of people, it's probably a good idea to understand what they're about and how they mm. work and, you know, what their, their sub, you know, their spirituality is based on. Yes. Because you want to actually understand that. So you know how to get it out of the picture, you know, and impose what, what they want to impose. So, um, uh, somewhere in these manuscripts, they, there's uh, they find out that you know in these interviews that you know the instrumentation you know had to do with different with was a way of communicating to different levels of the universe or to our world, and that the drums represented the earth and the heartbeat of the mother, the voice of the mother. And so the, the instruments that they had, they had at that time were wewetls, which is the voice of the ancestors, or voice of the grand, uh, grandfathers, grandmothers. And so the drum is the voice of, the, of our ancient past. It's from the earth. It's what's below us. It's our foundation. 
And then the Ayakashtis, the rattles, represented the, you know, the different kingdoms. They were divided into four kingdoms, you know, the, the plants, trees, animals, and the insects. And so rattles represent that. And then the flutes represent the upper world. And then, so now you have this trilogy, the flute, drum, and rattle, and, you know, all, you know, representing different parts of our world. And so when you do play them, you know, you are the voice of creation. And once the Jesuits found this out, along with other things, that dance was also part of this, then, you know, they were able to systematically, you know, tear it, take it down so that we no longer were able to communicate directly to our, to our, you know, our higher self, to um, that higher power. And that way they can introduce, you know, re, you know, the religions of the time, you know, Catholicism, Christianity, all that. And, you know, and then impose it through military, you know, through military force and also um, enforcing, enslaving the people and to work in the land for the, for the new, uh, the new landlords, which came from, from Europe. Mm. So it was, yeah, systematically took over everything. But the thing is, spirit is powerful. You know, it's within us. It's in our DNA. So we just have to reclaim it and get back to it. Yes. I, I feel like understanding this historical background of how these instruments, these ways of praying have has been taken from indigenous cultures is necessary in order to actually properly handle and respect these instruments. I feel like understanding the history is what makes one realize that it is important how you take care of this instrument and that it's not merely a piece of wood or a piece of animal skin or some seeds inside of a, a shell, that it's a sacred tool and I think in doing that alone in understanding the power and the sacredness of these instruments is what can lead others to simply take better care of their instruments. And I'm someone to blame as well in this, in my early path of, you know, just leaving my, my flute out or, or not really taking care of something and having it break in a way in which it certainly did not need to. And, uh, that's something that, that I've had to learn myself, but I've come to see that as I learn more about the origin of each one of these instruments, it completely changes my relationship to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love to segue because I know this is something you learned from many of your mentors. And then I am aware that you've learned uh, much from apprenticing with others. So I'd like to speak about apprenticeship in general. Not only if you are aiming to build instruments, but if you are aiming to live a ceremonial life or learn any trade, how has you apprenticing under these various elders impacted your life and, and eventually lead you into a position of mentorship that you are now in yourself? How has been this process of apprenticeship and mentorship? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, my apprenticeships were, um, I was, I'm very fortunate in that I had some of the best teachers to study with and from. And I don't know if it's by design or how, how it's worked, how it's worked, but you know, the, I'm very fortunate. And uh, some of my teachers were probably, you know, not really willing to, um, to be open about the knowledge and, you know, mm. but I think things change. I, th I feel things are changing now. That's the reason I've been putting a lot of things up on Instagram is that, you know, I have been teaching all around the world and, but I, I always try to do it with integrity. You know, I always, you know, uh, let the, my students know that, okay, what are you going to learn here today? What we're going to go through is, you know, these are ancient things. These are, you know, um, not to be taken lightly, you know, just, 
don't take the workshop and feel like you're gonna you're gonna monopolize it and you know and uh, create a you know start being making instruments and make a living from it. Mm. You know, it's I didn't that wasn't my intention at the beginning. You know, I was I was really uh, wholeheartedly about reclaiming this and also uh, about trying to do it for the community, you know, the community, the ceremonial community. Um, but I found out, I've, I've been finding out that sometimes it's not, the, you know, uh, sometimes the ceremonial community won't even support you. Mm. you no, know, they won't. Um, and you have to go outside and you have to look for, you know, and I was finding that, um, a lot of young people from all over the world were really, you know, uh, keen on learning what, what I knew and, and, uh, but, you know, you have to screen them out too. You have to kind of not, my teacher would say, you know, sometimes this knowledge is not for everybody. You have to be careful who you, who you give this knowledge to. And, um, so, you know, there's some screening that has to happen and, you know, see if the person that wants this knowledge has the integrity and is going to teach it in the right way. And, you know, I've had a few apprentices and they're all, I would say, um, you know, uh, very proud of them, very, you know, um, honored that they chose me as their teacher. And, you know, they, they get to use, you know, we get to use our name. We, my name and, but also it's like, um, like, uh, how do you say, um, like the, there's this, this pyramid, you know, it started with this one person with mm. Javier teaching me. And then for me, it goes on to other people and those people teach other people. The lineage. The lineage is really important. And, and, um, and my teacher always thought that was important too. You have to, you have to, you know, give respect to your teachers, the people you learn from, you know. So lately I've been, you know, because another one passed away, uh, Jackie Timothy, my co Salish friend. And I will do a little video about him shortly because he was inspirational. And, mm. um, you know, there's some key things that happened because of him. In what I do, and um, so I, I need to pay, you know, my respects to my teachers, and and uh, but like when I, I think the important thing is integrity. If you're going to do anything, do it properly. Do it honestly. You know, uh, do it from a good place. Because you know, I didn't think, hey, I'm going to learn all I can and, and try to make a, a ton of money. Yeah. From, you know, that wasn't the idea at all. You know, um, I think whatever living I have right now the, is a direct reflection of the amount of work I put into my craft and what I've choos chosen to do. Mm. Yes. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the state of, let's say, you know, my current generation. As I said, I'm 27. And there are many people globally that are interested in learning not only how to construct instruments, but how to experience ceremony, how to live a life of increased awareness of our connection to nature and spirit. Yeah. And I saw a video where you expressed that you feel like you are one of the few left remaining regarding people who are building these instruments in this way, or at least within the circle of elders and mentors that you have learned from. And I'm curious yeah. if you feel hopeful for the future or if it is bleak to, to you, because as a, as a young man myself, I don't know in which direction these traditions and these practices are going to go in because there are so many people my age 
who are not interested. It could be the farthest thing from their mind, uh, ceremonial work or, or awareness. And for someone who has been exposed to this way of life now, sometimes that is daunting and intimidating to me that so many of my fellow brothers and sisters and even adults in my life who are uh, older than me have no interest in this kind of work. And that people like you and some of my other teachers down in South America seem to be the minority instead of the, instead of the majority. So I'm curious how you feel as we step into the future in which direction we are going in and how we can do our best to sustain some of these traditional teachings. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting here. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to keep sharing knowledge right now with COVID. So, you know, I have to be careful. I have to watch myself because I'm in that age bracket, you know, I'm at risk. So, once this things, uh, the situation clears up with the COVID, I'm going to probably go back to teaching more. And, um, I used to do a lot of, a lot of, uh, art shows. And so I worked through, through that way as, as, as artistic. And, you know, you would run across people that were on a path or so forth. And they, you know, um, there's no denying a person that you know when you meet a person if they're they're walking a spiritual path there's a certain um presence that they have a certain feeling that i would get when i meet someone i go oh this is this person's wakan or this person has some knowledge you know um yeah we have to we have to we have to sit and listen to them and listen to them carefully because sometimes I know nowadays I've been meeting a lot of young people that they're doing combo, they're doing bufo, they're doing ayahuasca, they're doing uh, the mushrooms, you know, all these different medicines or all these different paths from all over the world. And these people want to do it all, mm. you know, uh, and because of the way the world is set up now, Everything is available now. You know, um, you can uh, make a phone call and have a, a combo ceremony in your house hmm. or a cacao ceremony or whatever. You know, it wasn't that easy. It wasn't like that when I was growing up, when I first started. You know, um, um, it's just today's age, things like seems, things are so readily available and you can, but you have to be careful too, you know, these are medicines from, from different people from all over the world. And, you know, um, if I'm going to be doing medicine ceremonies, um, I'll make, I'll make sure that the person I'm doing it with is from that tradition. Yes. Or is, you know, uh, yeah, it's had a, a, something funny happen, something interesting. Um, because, uh, I was talking to someone and they were asking me, so what kind of medicine did your teacher work with? <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that, that you have to have something. To yeah. take something to, to get to 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 be a ceremony, yeah. Or whatever. And I just said really simply, uh, we just did prayer. Mm. We didn't have to take you know anything, but but then there's like Maria Sabina, you know mm -hmm. she 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 strongly pushed the mushrooms that you know. It could really help people. And I, I feel like they can. I feel that's one of my traditions is the, the little children. Yes. As she called them. I have a strong affinity to that. Mm. And Peyote was my, uh, was my teacher's, uh, from his heritage, his, he's part of Wichol, so his, that's his medicine. You know, these are just merely guides to get us to the truth, to lift the veil 
you know, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good medicines in the world. Yeah. So we have to, uh, I think for the, for the youth, I would say, you know, don't go out and feel like you have to try everything. You know, I find meditation is important. Just praying, you know, praying for other people, praying with instruments. Um, if you want to do, um, you know, the ayahuasca and, and all the other, you know, all the frog medicines and all that, you know, um, do it consciously, you know, make sure you're doing it with, because I know with the, um, with the Huichol tradition, the Maracame, you know, he sees it like he's a guide, you know, all the people that are, they're trusting in him and to taking him into the spirit world when they, when they're doing the peyote ceremonies and they trust him, you know, bringing him back and also yes. interpreting the messages that they get in this, the spirit realm. And, you know, I'm not going to go into these different worlds, you know, and, and not have a good guide, you know, it's make sure you have someone that you, you trust to mm. take you there and to bring you back. Yeah. I couldn't agree more for many people of my generation who are getting into these plant medicine ceremonies. And, uh, I have always given thanks for the elders that I've met down in South America for working with the highest integrity with these, with these medicines. And it seems to be a reoccurring theme in our conversation, but Another story that comes to mind for me that radically shifted my life was one of my first times inside of a medicine ceremony. It was with uh, San Pedro, Aguacoya, Wachuma, and I had not ingested any of the medicine. Yet, an hour into the experience, I was having a full-on, full-body experience within that space without physically ingesting the medicine. And uh, those moments continue to occur for me dozens of times throughout my life in recent years. And it was that initial moment that taught me it's the power of ceremony. It's the power of community. It's the power of laying these offerings down and calling in the directions and calling in our ancestors. That is the medicine. It's not only the plant matter. And, uh, mm. I would agree with you there. Mm. I think people are not fully realizing how powerful they really are. So um, when I pray to the north, that's the color white. That's about winter and about um, looking within and that divine light, our divinity, you know, our sacred nature, you know, realizing how powerful we, we, we can be and we are. You know, we don't always have to bring in something from the outside, but, mm. but for some people it's, it's important, you know, it's a tool. Yes. Especially for those healers that, that are trained in that, you know, they, they can, they can help you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I would love to hear, this may sound like, uh, or be an unexpected question, but I would love to, as we wrap up here how fatherhood has impacted your work and your life as someone who does not have children yet but plan to i always take an opportunity when i speak with someone who i truly respect to get their take on parenthood and how we can better raise our children during these very confusing and difficult times and how becoming a father has shifted the course of your life wow this is something I talk to a lot about when I have a, a young, a young apprentice, especially a young male, you know, um, children are a gift, you know, maybe not for everybody, but you know, if, if you do happen to have a child, you know, you have to treat that child as an individual person not as property, but so, you know, like a, a soul that you're going to guide and give, and give the, 
you know, build him up as a, as a responsible human being. Mm. And, you know, um, look out for that well-being of a child. You know, those, those are really big responsibilities. And I started my, I started uh, being a father at, uh, just before 30, just before I hit 30. So kind of young, but I wouldn't say too young. Wasn't like 21 or 19. Yeah. And it, I was just floored by the, the beauty of seeing a child come into the world and just brings you to tears. You know, like it's truly one of the most beautiful things you, you ever get to see. But then, then comes the, the real world stuff, you know, the, the taking care of day in, day out. You have to be selfless. You have to, you know, give up certain things, put off things in your life because, you know, a child needs, you know, a child has its needs, you know, it's, and uh, fortunately for me, you know, I had a, a good community that I, I, I came, came into in the Waldorf school and, you know, helped me as a parent, seeing them, a child as a, as a sacred being. And, but also in the ceremonial community, you know, um, in the naming ceremonies, you know, presenting your child to the, to the world, to the spirit world. And that, you know, I'm going to devote my life to nurturing these children, to be good humans, like I want to be. And I think I've succeeded. My children are, you know, they're, they're like my age now when I first had a child. Hmm. And they're, they're beautiful human beings. That's the most I can ask for. Mm. You know, some people, you know, they want their children to be a doctor or a lawyer, or, you know, they want, they want them to be certain things. I just wanted my child to be happy and to be the person that, you know, that they, they need to be not what I want them to be. So that's my recommendation. Be careful who you have children with, you know, be responsible. And if, you know, um, be careful in your partner. If you're going to choose someone to have a child with, make sure it's the right person. Mm. And then when the child does come, do the right thing and raise that child to be a good human being. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Guillermo. Uh, I feel so honored to be able to have had this conversation with you. And I really want to encourage my listeners and those who are listening to this episode or watching it to delve into your work because I didn't even want to touch on the surface of all the different topics you teach through your Patreon and Instagram, because I want to funnel people towards your, your page and to all of your content. So okay. I, I would love for you to share some of your information with us, your website, your Instagram, and how people can reach you. Sure. So I chose the name Quetzalcoatl Music. For my company name, Quetzalcoatl, being the patron deity of, of music and poetry and beautiful things in life, of the humanities. Because it's, I felt that's what represented me but the best, Quetzalcoatl. Mm -hmm. The Feathered Serpent, so that's my uh, Quetzalcoatlmusic.org is my website. It's also my YouTube channel, Quetzalcoatl Music. And on my Instagram is what, uh, Quetzal, Quetzal 13 or Quetzal, no, Quetzal 13. And, um, and my Patreon, I think is under my name and there's, you know, uh, yeah. We're going to so, put all those links in the, in the information for people to find. Okay. So thank you so much. And, uh, yeah. 
I just want to let you know as a, as a footnote that your drum rescue video saved my first drum and it has been playing perfectly ever since. So just, for those, just for those listening uh, who are acquiring these instruments and may have issues or repairs, uh, Guillermo's content is amazing for learning how to take care of these instruments in a proper way and also learn more about them. So thank you so much, brother. May you and your family continue to be blessed. And I very much hope we can do this again sometime in the future. Sure. All right. Well, you take care. And you too. Bless all of you and your listeners. Blessings. There's a baby we'll chick born. Really? Oh. I saw some activity going on outside oh, in the back. Uh. <laughs> wow. What a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's tiny. It's wow. Little scrama, probably probably ten minutes old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what an honor. Of course, just as you were speaking about children <laughs> and, and raising children, that happens. <laughs> and heard it chirping. Wow. wow. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation between Guillermo and I, I strongly encourage you to follow him on Instagram at Quetzalcoatl13. He also has an amazing website for his shop, which you can find at Quetzalcoatlmusic.org. He also has an incredible Patreon account listed under his name, Guillermo Martinez, in which he teaches people how to play flutes, how to build these instruments, how to understand the historical background and everything else we discussed in this episode. So please follow those resources linked below the description of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend, leave a rating and a review, and continue to support this podcast in any way you can because... Every little bit of help, every little share really means everything to me and the rest of my team. So thank you all for tuning in and look forward to seeing you again soon. Peace.